Hi, I'm Yesham Nicholson, and you're listening to another episode of Your Big Career Move. Now, if you're a regular listener to my podcast, then you'll know that one of my absolute favorite things to do is to talk to people who are passionate about what they do for a living. I just find it really inspiring. And that's why I love chatting to today's guest, Martin Knight. It's kind of impossible not to get caught up in his passion and his excitement for what he does for a living nowadays. And it's really people like Martin who are the reason behind this podcast. It's all about sharing stories of people who prove that a career change is not only possible, but it can absolutely be the best thing that's ever happened to you. If you've been considering a career change of your own for a while and you're not sure where to start or you'd love a boost of confidence, then why not head to yescareercoaching.com to see if I might be able to help. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy listening to my interview with Martin. Uh, we have a few laughs along the way and I know I'm biased, but I really, really love this conversation and I hope you do too. Thank you so much, Martin, for joining me today. It's a pleasure to have you here. No, a pleasure, a pleasure to be here. And like I do with all my guests, let's start with what you were doing before you made your big career change. Um, I went to art school and studied as a as a designer um, and then uh, joined a, a company in Bristol and worked my way up and ran an international design business for 27 years, I think it was in the end. Wow. Um, so, so, so quite some time. So tell us about your career before you made the change. Like, was it something that you enjoyed doing or like, how was it for you? Yeah, no, I, you know, like I said, I went to art school and um, was was in into design, graphic design, and you know, I loved it. I I, I genuinely loved it. Hence why I, I I did it for so long. And you know, the company that I was with, I sort of worked my way up and and you know, basically became managing director. Uh, and we were successful, and you know, we worked all over the world, which was incredible and exciting, and. Um, and yeah, it was great, but you know, it came with challenges and it came came with pressures. And um, I think I got to a stage where I either did it for another twenty seven years, um, or or there was there was something else in the locker. And um, I always said that the good days have got to outweigh the bad, and and always kind of kept that in my mind. And and it was just, I think it was the right time. Mm -hmm. I change and that was something that, that I really wanted to do was always try and do something that stimulated me and made me happy and so one day I just said you know it's not happening anymore I'm gonna I'm gonna do something different I think that the idea of doing it for another potentially another 27 years was a little bit daunting and like I said a man and boy and I hadn't experienced anything else I hadn't done anything else I hadn't you know tried anything else I hadn't sort of worked in different companies and you know chopped and changed and, and experienced different things so so I think it was like you know what let's see if I can turn my hands to someone else and I didn't think I was gonna change quite like I did you mm -hmm. know so far removed um, and I think I had at the time, plenty of offers of different agencies going, oh, come and work for us. It'd be great. You know, come and do it. And I just thought, well, that's almost the easy option. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to do that, then maybe I'd have just stuck out what I was doing. So I was desperate to try and, you know, carve out something a bit different and something that was really passionate. Yeah. So it was offers from companies similar to the ones you were working. Yeah. So it was obviously when I left, obviously word got out and a few companies approached me and said, oh, can, can you come? You know, we'd love to have you on board and help us achieve what you've achieved and help you know, you know build us. And I just thought, well, I've, I've sort of done that. <laughs> Time to do something different, I think. And yeah. so politely said, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Um, so did you literally wake up one morning and go, I know I'm going to make a change or was it a gradual thing? I think it was a gradual thing in terms of always wanting to be happy um, mm -hmm. and to be fulfilled. And so, like I said to my wife, good days got to outweigh the bad. And, and, yeah. and, you know, going through COVID and stuff like that, it was certainly really challenging and really stressful. And I just thought, you know what, I'm not doing, I'm not doing this forever. I'm not mm -hmm. doing it forever. And as soon as that sort of switch had gone on in my head, it was like, well, what are you waiting for? And is that like you? Are you normally somebody that goes... Well, I've made a decision and I'll I'll just do it. Uh I think once I've made a decision, I stick to it. Uh, let, mm -hmm. Let's let's put it that way. And um I'm not necessarily really impulsive. I don't just sort of go 
one direction and another. Hence, you know, I was there for 27 years. So yeah. you know, I see it through and, and uh, I think I've got grit and determination, if you know what I mean. Uh, so not necessarily really impulsive, but, you know, I think we all were going through such a, a challenging time, you know, uh, you know, during COVID and, and, and stuff and sort of all reflecting and all kind of um, looking at, at what we do and seeing that life was fragile, seeing that, you know, things are delicate and that kind of brought it to the fore, really. Yeah. I think for a lot of time, COVID was like the perfect opportunity to take that time out and reflect, wasn't it? So it sounds like mm. it got you as well. Mm. So so can you tell us what was going through your mind at that time? Like what were the fears surrounding leaving something that was really familiar to you that you'd done for 27 years? Can you remember what your biggest fear or fears were at the time? Uh, yeah, at the time, I think I was quite excited. Oh. You, know, you know, this is an opportunity. I'm, a, a, I'm an optimistic guy I think and cup is always half full Mm -hmm. um so it was like you know I've got an opportunity here uh, to do something and do something incredible I had no idea what I was going to do I mean I literally had no idea I was just like just I've got to do something and and I think um I think you've got to give yourself that space to, to kind of really think and really kind of get to understand what it is that you want and so having a bit of space, and I was fortunate enough to sort of, you know, buy myself some time, shall we say, and, you know, milling around at home, kind of, you know, doing all the jobs and all the chores. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of felt, well, okay, what am I going to do? And, and then that allows you the space to kind of be able to kind of really get deep into your mind, if you know what I mean. Um, what were the people so around you? you jump out of one yeah. role and then mm-hmm. just jump into another role, mm-hmm. you sort of, there's not that whole kind of reflection and and time to kind of really get to the nubbin of what you want to do. Yeah, very true. So whilst it was exciting, I, I think after a while it was a bit like, oh, okay, uh, I do need to sort of do something. You know, I can't just do this forever. <laughs> um, so did I you take there was out? a little bit of anxiety there as well. Mm. How long? How much time did you take out? Probably about six months in the end. Okay, great. Good um, amount. And what were people saying to you at that time? Like your peers, your friends, your colleagues, your family? They were like, okay, so what are you going to do? Uh, uh, and I was like, I don't know yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll do something, <laughs> you know. Um, and I think, you know, given that I was in one business for such a long time, it's quite hard to sort of define your exact skills. It was such a varied role. And it, like mm-hmm. I say, you know, started as a designer and ended up sort of running the place. And that was all through sort of, I guess, intuition and gut and feeling and and um, and emotion to some degree. And hadn't, you know, gone on X, Y, Z courses here or X, Y, Z courses there. So, you know, it was like, oh, OK, uh, you know, when you distilled it on paper, you know, who was I? And that was, I think that for me was like the most daunting thing is sort of sitting there with a piece of paper and sort of going, right, okay, well, I guess I better write a CV and, you know, you know, writing sort of what I had done and then going, well, is that it? I mean, to me, is that it? But other people were like, oh, wow, that looks yeah. amazing. But, you know, you sort of feel a bit like, oh, okay. Uh, you know, there was one block. <laughs> it wasn't like oh, I worked here and then I worked here and, then I worked here. So I was a bit like, oh, okay, right. And I think, you know, having worked and ran a, a, a successful agency, it was like, I don't think I want to go and work for someone else. I want to kind of do my own thing, really. That mm-hmm. was that was pretty quick in my mind. So, yeah, it was then a question of what that was going to be. Mm-hmm. And how did you decide ultimately? Well, I've kept bees in my back garden for must be 15 years now and and my daughter when she was young had hay fever pretty bad my wife being an osteopath was like seriously we're not going to you know give her loads of drugs you know we've got to find an alternative way to sort of treat this and um, we read on the internet that you know local honey was a supposedly a, a good cure mm-hmm. so I was like, oh wow I'd love to you know keep bees and so I was promptly booked on the course and off I went. Um, I'm just going to stop you there because, Martin, most people go, oh, local honey, I'll nip to my local shop or farm shop yeah. or whatever and buy some local honey. Mm. I love that you then went to the extreme. You're like, no, I won't buy it. I'll just create my own honey from yeah. scratch. Yeah. And, I, and when you put it like that, that seems like quite radical. Uh, but it, for me, it was just like, 
well, I'll, I'll keep some bees. That sounds great. Mm. Um, and I think I love being outdoors. I'm an outdoors sort of guy. Uh, I always hunkered for, you know, being the weekends and summer evenings where the opportunity was to be outside. So another excuse to be outside, I think, was, you know, was definite for me. Okay. Um, so I went on the course, loved it from like minute one. I was like, this is cool. So come back, said I loved it, bought a hive immediately with some bees, got them in the back garden. Kids were like, okay, is this okay? Are we okay having bees here? But they quickly sort of understood, you know, do's and don'ts. Don't use it as cricket stumps or goalposts. Uh, you know, just let them kind of be <laughs> in the corner. They won't harm you if you don't harm them sort of thing. And we were fortunate enough to get some honey, uh, which was great. And I enjoyed the process of sort of, you know, tinkering and sort of looking after them. And I'm pleased to say my daughter's never suffered from hay fever ever since. So it was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, brilliant for the planet, brilliant for people, brilliant for my daughter's health. How cool. And then obviously just keeping them in the garden to varying degrees of success, I guess, over the years. And I guess, I, you know, when I was working and sort of traveling quite a bit with work and they were just another Thing for me to do at the weekend mm -hmm. uh, I'll cut the grass clean the car you know take the kids to football ballet or, or wherever parties mm -hmm. um and it was just I guess a long list of, of of chores um so I loved it but it was always another thing to do and then having then stopped work I then had a lot more time to be in amongst the bees which which was great because I sort of fell back in love with it and was like, oh my God, this is just like remarkable. I love it. What is like, it that you love about it? It's the not knowing, first and foremost. You know, it's, they say crack a hive open, you literally crack a hive open, you sort of get your hive torn, crack the roof off because they've sealed it all down to make it all watertight. And then you hear that kind of pitch change, that hum change of bees. Mm -hmm. And you open it up and you look, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, you can go in there and they've sort of taken a turn for the worst or they can be thriving and they've made loads of honey. And it's just that anticipation. And But the energy and the feeling and the smell is, is just unbelievable. And not running at it at a million miles an hour, having time to just go, you know what, I've got all the time in the world. I'm not yeah. doing anything today. Yeah. Uh, I can just enjoy it. Yeah. And it kind of gave me some mindfulness i think at that time and gave me obviously at that time loads of thoughts pinging around in my head what am i going to do you know what's my next step um and that gave me a chance to kind of just be free from all those thoughts mm -hmm. and just be at one with the bees because you've got 60,000 bees in front of you it focuses the mind <laughs> yeah. <Everything else> disappears disappears <laughs> um so 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 yes you know being with the bees was like okay uh I can let all that go and I really enjoyed it I really really genuinely enjoyed it and so then everybody should do this everybody should have bees because like it's amazing mm -hmm. um why don't they have bees fear knowledge expertise time oh, I've got all those <laughs> Uh, and in my previous life, in my previous role of working with large corporates all over the world, um, you know, dealing with sort of employee engagement and vision and values and environmental policies and sustainability reports, corporate social responsibility, team building. I was like, well, businesses should do this because individuals may not be able to do it, may not be able to afford it, or they may not be able to have space. You know, they live mm -hmm. it's not possible. Businesses generally can afford it, generally have got space and they are essentially small communities which is what you want to kind of bring together and so I was like I know what I'll just phone some so I did a bit like the beehive I'll mm -hmm. just go and get a beehive I'll just go and phone someone so I phoned like a handful of of businesses and told them what I was thinking of doing or that I was already doing it uh and they were like brilliant when can we have some mm -hmm. so I was like a uh, couple of weeks and they were like brilliant come over let's get it all sorted and that's that's how it started literally that's how it started and now you're running nights beekeeping, nights beekeeping. Yeah. yeah 
and uh, running a successful business that is, you know, on the cusp of going to a whole nother level. Just to give you a sort of synopsis of what it is, Knights Beekeeping basically manage beehives for organisations all over the southwest at the moment, but, you know, going further afield. Um, so we come in and speak to the organisation, speak to try and ascertain what they want, what they're trying to achieve, you know, so whether we're working with a hotel and they want to have it honey as a sort of fundamental part of their kind of menu or, or in their cocktails, or actually, you know, they just want to have it as a sort of team building thing. So then we work out location where we can put them in a sort of safe place and we want to try and keep them at their grounds because that then helps A, people go out and use them as a kind of place of reference and team building they can all get some suits on come out have a talk get involved uh go out and they use it as the new powwow if you know what i mean in terms yeah. of water cooler they go out and go oh, should we go and have a chat by the bees and <laughs> go and have a cup of tea by the bees and watch the bees come in and out and it's and, and it's great have a biscuit and then i spin all the honey for them and then they have that honey to get, to give to employees or or use as marketing material or do with whatever, whatever. they want using mm. the kitchens, and just a sort of powerful way to communicate what they're doing and what their beliefs are from internal perspective of as an organisation. I think we're all aligned to businesses now that have a purpose mm -hmm. and have meaning, and this is what we stand for as an organisation, and this is what we believe in. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. I love that our, our organization does that and having worked with numerous people and doing lots of talks all through, you know, last summer and this, people are so, so grateful to have the time to be go, oh my God, this is amazing. I can't believe that we do this, mm. you know, get some suits on and, so and cool. you, you know, it's just great. And, and that's one thing that I hadn't, I guess, legislated for was I knew it was great for the bees because they've been in a massive decline over the last decade or so with modern farming practices and, and so forth. Um, and I knew it was great for the environment. I knew it was great for us from a health perspective, you know, my daughter, but I hadn't legislated by how much joy it brings and how it brings people together. Mm -hmm. And so like working with Bista Village, I could look after their bees and you've got the guy who's head of contracts dealing with, I don't know, all the top brands that they've got there. Versace and Gucci and and, and what have Britling, and then you've got a guy who's like maintenance, <laughs> and they come on the talk and then their worlds collide yeah. and they're getting on and they're they're laughing and joking and there's you know like oh my god, and now so when they leave, they they've got a common a common thing Definitely. and you know they don't just ignore each other whilst walking down the yeah. The corridors, they're sort of, oh, yeah, you all right? Yeah, how's your bees? Yeah, no, no, great, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I haven't quite legislated for that. And I, and that fulfills me and fills me with so much joy. I can quite imagine. I mean, it's a win-win-win situation, isn't it? And actually just hearing you say, you know, that these two guys or, or ladies or whatever, that they're, that they suddenly have this thing in common that they can talk about, even though their jobs are in completely different yeah. departments, they would never cross yeah. paths normally. And I think a lot of companies are so keen to get this collaboration yeah. within their organizations and actually organizing like team events and like even parties, barbecues, they're a little yeah. bit contrived and yeah, a bit awkward <laughs> in yeah. some situations. And I think what you're providing is, well, I mean, you described it so beautiful. It's just this lovely thing that people get to share and talk about that's totally yeah. different to anything else that's going on in their lives so i you yeah know, exactly I, I mean it's, it. It, it, you know the organization by doing this is providing something that is not generally obtainable for people unless yeah. they book themselves to go on a course or they keep bees yeah so it's like oh wow this is quite far removed i can go to a barbecue any weekend i can have my own barbecue i can do whatever i want i can okay. go to a party go to the okay. pub but this is something like really removed and actually there's a sense of anxiety a little bit of fear and so people are sort of stood there and they're, they're that exactly what you just said a little bit awkward with one another because I don't really know you I don't really know what you do I don't really know what what happens in your world and so mm. they've sort of I've not been thrusted together but they've sort of wanted to come on because they've got an interest or the business has said oh you know you come and do this and then there's that sort of stood in the car park kind of like mm, all right yeah I'm all right polite conversation and then there's nothing better than going right okay 
here's a bee suit. <laughs> it's a one size fits all situation. Get it on. And so they're all like, oh, OK. And, and you know they put them on, and everybody you know, like points and laughs at each other, and go, "Oh, look at you!" And they do the sort of spaceman walk, and then we go down to the hives, whether we all hop in the back of the truck or or walk out into their grounds. And you know, you ask if there's any questions, and there's you know a smattering, and then you crack open the hive, and then you can literally it's palpable. You can hear the sharp into, and then the sort of silence. And then the barrage of questions just hit you like a tsunami, just like, oh, what's this? What's that? What's this? What's that? And just, you can feel the excitement. And, and as you go through and as you lift, oh, oh my God, look at that. Oh my God, there's honey. And it's just <laughs> brilliant. Just brilliant. Yeah. Uh, you can't shut people up, you know, yeah. quite frankly, which is That's joyful. That must be We've safe. We've been on those talks where it's just a bit awkward and everyone's sort of like, oh, when's this going to finish? And people are sort of looking at their watch or glancing at their phones. None of that, which is great. So I think a lot of people listen to my podcast interviews. They might know other people who made big career changes from, you know, anything to anything. Um, but they, they're like, well, it's OK for Martin because I don't know, whatever. You know, he had this hobby and he somehow he had these contacts and, you know, he turned those contacts into clients. Brilliant. Good for him. But I don't have that. I'll be starting from scratch. What do you say to that? For you in particular, what were the skills or your, I don't know, your abilities or experiences that you brought from your corporate world, if you like, into your own business? Well, uh, there were a lot of challenges. Don't get me wrong. And it's not like it's just sort of walked out of this and just jumped onto that. And, you know, I think it's about being brave and being confident that you can you can do it. And having worked with large organizations all over the world, you know, they make plenty of mistakes and they don't do everything like brilliantly. And so that was, you know, we're all here just trying to, you know, do something. And whether you're big or small, we're all faced with the same challenges to some degree, just um, mm-hmm. on, on, on greater scales. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my, my, my previous role also gave me the confidence to do talks to people and to speak to people and communicate, which I think is important. But apart from that, that old life gave me nothing for this life. You know, I'm not the best beekeeper in the world by a long stretch, but I'm prepared to learn. I'm prepared to do everything I can. And I think I'm probably a little bit more experienced than maybe a lot of the people that I work with and so therefore I can provide something you know and I, w- I won't always get it right that's mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. that's okay uh but what I will do is try my damnedest to make it right the next time and working with nature is different from working with people <laughs> very different and you've got to allow nature to be nature and you've got to roll with the punches yeah. and that was I think quite difficult for me first and foremost was like I want to make it brilliant. I want to make it a bit amazing. But you, you can't shoehorn things into a place they don't want to go until they're ready to get. And I think that is something that we can all learn from. Is like, it's got to be the right time and the right place. And it's got to be you know, right for the audience, if you know what I mean. And I didn't phone people that I knew. I phoned people that were within a circumference of where I could get to. I'd, oh, right. I'd, so the, your, I, yeah. the people that you contacted first off weren't people that no. were already in your network. You, no. Did you literally no. cold call them? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Because I didn't want to do this and think I've done this on the back of a few mates. Mm-hmm. You know, and look, don't get me wrong. I've got some friends, some very dear friends that are clients and, and that's brilliant. I love that. But I've also, you know, the first people I found... I didn't know from Adam and they went it's a great idea when can you come and I was like <laughs> <laughs> uh, I sort of tried to sound like I was busy oh I could fit you in next week <laughs> yeah no I could maybe get you in on like Monday Tuesday and they were like oh great yeah brilliant we'll, we'll put some time in the diary and so, I mean that's so reassuring isn't it that the first few people that you call are like yeah when can you come in then you know you're onto something don't you yeah, exactly. I think, you know, like you're absolutely right. You know, if I would have just been, you know, just friends, for instance, then, you know, they're just doing me a favour. Is it, is it, you know, they're just sort of helping me out. And you never really know. Mm. You've got to test it and test it early. Yeah. So, 
that's what I did. And then I, I work with sort of lots of hotels, mm -hmm. which is great. And, you know, there's a clear line of sight, I guess, from honey to breakfast table to menu. You know, there's a direct correlation. And it was like, oh, OK, well, I could just phone all the hotels in the area and see whether they want to do it. But that was like then you'd be pigeonholed into just the sort of hotel and leisure industry. Mm -hmm. So I purposely then went, OK, well, I've got a few of those. Now I need to do something completely different. So like, you know, Everhot make amazing cookers and ranges and thought, OK, well, they're a successful business. They're local. Phone them. Love it. Let's let's start. You know, Marshfield ice cream, amazing. The wave in Bristol, amazing. Osteopathic practices in Bristol. There's, you know, all all over Bristol Village, like I said. Um, so and now you know, got to a point where people are contacting you because the word's got out. Yes, yes. You know, I've got my little Instagram page at Night Speakeeping, mm -hmm. um, which works you know fairly well and you know get lots of followers but word gets out and people contact me on that and then suddenly you know it, there's this sort of wave of people and now people from further afield are, are speaking and contacting me so from you know london and and liverpool and edinburgh and so i was like well i can't quite get to you so that's where night's beekeeping 2.0 is now just about the launch, actually, in that I've got little apiaries um, locally. Well, mm -hmm. Apiaries is where, you know, collective for bees, essentially, a little, a little part of land. And um, uh, I keep the bees for people that I can't get to, say, in London or what have you, on this bit of land. And I was like, oh, wow. And they still get all the imagery because I am document all my hives through imagery because that's how my sort of creative mind works, really. It's better than mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. So I can remember what's going on. And then I send them those images all the time. Like, oh, I've been to your bees today. This is what's happening. So they feel connected, given that they're not on their ground. Um, and then they can use that on their social channels and their intranet mm -hmm. and what have you. Brilliant. So they're doing this amazing thing. Talk about it. You know, that's, yeah. I guess, my background in terms of communication is really mm -hmm. important. So do something great. Go and talk about it. Because you're doing it. You might as well let people know whether Thank that's internal or external. It's a lovely story. Hmm. Exactly. Hmm. Um, so I give them all those those images and they get all the you know honey that comes out of it and I take it up to them. But what is great is that they have a you know team days out. So they come down from London or, or Cambridge or wherever they've mm -hmm. from and um have a day out and it and it's and it's great because yeah, you know, getting out of the office having some, I guess, some strategy session in the morning or talk about where they're going as an organisation or as a team and then having a sort of breakout into the bees. Just, you know, people love it. Really fun. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And, and the guy last time, he was in the back of the Land Rover and we were going across the field to the apiary and uh, he, he found his, his partner, I think it was his wife, and, and he said, it's like I'm in Jurassic Park. It's unbelievable. <laughs> And that's the thing. It's like, you know, you've got somebody who's from, like, I guess, London in in, his, in the city, doesn't get out to the country very often, and mm -hmm. you're connecting them with nature. Yeah. And you're connecting them with bees and with the environment. There's, you know, I'm lucky enough that there was deer jumping through the field. It's like, oh, my God. And it's like, look, this is, this is around us. We've got to look after it, and we've got to cherish it, and we've got to do something to ensure that it's here for future generations. Yeah. And so by connecting, they feel invigorated and empowered and inspired to do something about it, whether that's they, they can't keep bees potentially in the city, but they can plant bee friendly plants or put up bird boxes or do things that do help, you know, no mo may and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, it's just about inspiring people. really. Yeah. And I mean, as an employer, who doesn't want employees that come back from something like that? Totally reinvigorated, full of wonder, you yeah. know, having connected with nature. Yeah. It's really special. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And like I said, there's that, that there's that gratefulness and the gratitude of being able, to, given the opportunity to do it. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what I tell people, you know, having run an organisation and put on 
those various different events that we spoke about and people enjoy it but you don't often hear that as somebody's put it on Mm -hmm. and I always say to them because they go oh thank you so much thank you so much brilliant loved it loved every minute and I said well make sure you tell people that that put you on this because they don't necessarily always hear that yeah it's nice to have that feedback for sure Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure and so you know I get them going, oh, we heard it's really great. And I do, and I love that then because they feel great because they put it on and they feel great. There's a whole great. <laughs> Again, learning. we're going back to the win-win-win situation, aren't we? Yeah. Like everyone's yeah. winner. We're opening up more apiaries for people to be able to, you know, from wherever, put, yeah. put bees on. And then our idea then is to rewild that land. So, you know, get some pigs in, turn all the soil over, plant wildflowers that are native to that area, put some bat boxes up, bird boxes, plant some oak trees because they're the you know biggest harbour of biodiversity that we have and just let nature reclaim it. And so then when people come, it's this like little oasis, which is amazing. And, you know, they're not just, the bees are the focal point, you know, and they are the facilitator that builds all this lovely, team building builds this feel good factor helps with the environment helps with the biodiversity and is the reason why all this other nature is now being drawn like a magnet to these little areas and i think that's great and and then we want to have like plaques so this field is basically sponsored by xyz and run by night's beekeeping and and for people to enjoy yeah really you know, cool that's, that's the thing people love that enjoy. Can yeah. you remember, Martin, when you were sort of in the early days of setting up this business, mm. was there a plan B? <laughs> plan B. Uh, there's always plan B. This is plan B. Um, no, um, no, no, it was just, I'm going to do this. And after that, first happens. Call, it was just, well, clearly people like it. Mm. So then I was like, oh, I'll phone someone else. Yeah. Brilliant. Through the, you know, I was going to say yellow pages. I mean, you know, use them to show my age now. Uh, but then, you know, found someone else, and they were like, "Yeah, great." So then it was clear to me that it was it's something. There was an appetite. Yeah. All I've got to do is is fulfill it. Yeah. And I mean, it's always hard to say, isn't it? But do you feel like the timing was right for you? Is there a part of you that wishes you'd done it sooner? Probably not later, yeah. because I can see how much you're enjoying it. Yeah. I mean, I look back and go, oh, I wish I, I, wish I did it years ago. Because I love the outdoors. I love everything. But, you know, I don't think the time was quite right then. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, lots of things happen for reasons, don't they? Uh, and, you know, whether I was at the right place, whether the world was in the right place, whether my clients were in the right place, you know, we're all sort of at this point where there's a need now. And, and whoever I was pushing on that door 10 years ago, whether there would have been a need. And, then, yeah. and I'm not sure there would have been. So I sort of feel like it's almost like the alchemist, right? Everything gets you to a place and for a reason. Mm. And do you see yourself doing this for the rest of your life? What's your plan? Uh, yes, I do. 100% um and as it grows obviously you know not doing quite as much of everything and Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but certainly working with people and you know hopefully inspiring people um and always working with Bija um and you know creating this patchwork of nature all over the UK I think is what's driving me now is like clearly this will work and you know in my mind, bees will, well, not in my mind, it's a fact, that the bees will fly potentially five miles from a hive in any given direction. So if I strategically place these apiaries 10 miles apart, I've sort of, in my mind, got coverage, like a phone network, mm-hmm. you know, telephone miles. And so fill that one up, do that one, do that one. Okay, well, I've now covered this area. Now I can put another one here. Now I can put, and then suddenly we've got this little patchwork across the south, Nice. across the southwest across you know just grow it out and that's what's driving me and then managing those little kind of those little areas i think is is would be really cool yeah sounds really amazing really cool. it's like a like a putting together a puzzle isn't it yeah 
really fun. And, you know, it fills me with joy and I know that I'm doing something really worthwhile. Yeah. As well, you know, and, and, you know, it's fulfilling on many levels. Yeah. And what would your advice be to somebody who's in a job that they're not enjoying anymore for whatever reason? And they're like, you know, I really just want to, I'm so jealous of Martin because he's found something that brings him joy. That's earning him an income and look at him like he's thriving but I really have no idea what I would do. What would your advice be? Well, my advice would be if you're not happy, change it, mm-hmm. you know, and I didn't have a clue. I literally didn't have a clue. And, you know, I'm, I guess, fortuitous and, and, and lucky. But, you know, you there's no point in going through and just being unhappy and stressed and just not enjoying it because life's too short. So I think you've got to do something that you enjoy and... You know, I, I'm thankful that I had some time to be able to kind of really think about what gave me joy and mm. then go and try and do something with that. I did, you know, a lot of books that you read or a lot of stuff that you read online of like, find what makes you happy and then somehow the rest falls into place, you know, uh, whether that's making cakes or or... or gardening or what have you if you've got a real passion go and do something with it because then you'll work out how it all fits so I have a question for you because one of my previous guests uh it was his wife that suggested that he he was really into design and she suggested to him why don't you go and do something to do with design which he ultimately did but he had this theory that she could have said anything to him that day he was really I guess he'd hit rock bottom he wouldn't mind me saying and really had no idea what he wanted to do. And his theory to this day, which he he sort of stated tongue in cheek, but he said, you know, she could have said anything to me that day and I would have gone and done it and I would have made it happen. So I guess my question to you is if it hadn't been beekeeping, Mm -hmm. what are the chances do you think that you would have found something else that you felt passionate about? Uh, Fairly high, I think. You know, I, you know, I like playing a lot of sport. I, I coach sport you know, um, whether that's football or cricket. And and so I think in the back of my mind, I was I was thinking more down those lines, if I'm honest mm-hmm. with you, as a mm-hmm. first um, step out into what am I going to do? That was my immediate thing because I'd already done various different coaching badges and what have you. And, you know, it was outside and I love sport and that's great. Uh, but, yeah, just having that time with the bees, I just fell in love with it again. And so it was obvious to me um, <laughs> that this is what needs to happen. Yeah. So, you know, I think if that hadn't, if I didn't do beekeeping, I think there would have been something. Um, and yeah, I was thinking about a cricket academy, um, mm. which, would, which would have been fun. Yeah. Well, and I, th- and I'm actually, I'm really relieved to hear you say that because I think people believe that they, you know, they either have a passion that they can turn into some that they can use as part of their work um, or they don't, you know. And I think there's, there, I mean, we, we live in a world with so much opportunity, with so mm-hmm. many things going on. And I mean, you can create a business out of practically anything. A lot yeah. of people, it just wouldn't occur to them that you can create a business out of beekeeping. They're like, well, it's a really nice hobby. I'll I'll have a little beehive in my garden and thanks very much and I'll tend to them in between everything else like you used to in in the past when you had a full-time job and I think sometimes it is just that mindset isn't it that actually you can turn pretty much anything you're interested in into a business I heard something the other day there's a guy on YouTube and the way he earns his money is he goes up to people who have really expensive cars and he asks them what what they've done to be able to afford a car like that and he makes millions from literally just going asking people but I'm like but that's brilliant you know he found he's passionate about I don't know maybe being filmed maybe being on camera but also he loves sports cars yeah yeah and um and you know and it is we, we just live in this world where like pretty much whatever you can dream up you can do yeah I mean I, I said exactly that to my son on holiday last week um we were walking back from the beach and I don't know how we got chatting about it. And I just, I just said, look, all you got to do in life is, is find something you really enjoy and, you know, provide that enjoyment for other people. 
there's a there's a need, right? Whether you're good at football, okay. Well, if you're really you know good at football and you really enjoy it, then go and coach it or go and you know do something within football that you know inspires you. Yeah. You know, you just got to be able to provide something that not necessarily everyone else can do or have time to do or or, or what have you. So, yeah. you know, you can create a business out of anything, like you just said, and and it's. How much was money and making an income? How much of a worry or concern was that for you? Um, I think I guess that was the 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 biggest challenge for me in terms of like I'd come from a successful organization that you know I had a decent income and I was very grateful for that and we had a lifestyle that you know, I guess you know fitted with that um and so you know there's, there's obviously been a, a you know a sort of dip in that but you could quickly build that up and actually I'm, I'm on a par now in you know less than two years it's like ridiculous and, this is, you know, and I think well all the stress and all the strife that I had there and all the stress and strife I've got here <laughs> not even in the same stratosphere yeah amazing it was a challenge um yeah. you know we had some savings and what have you um we had to make some adjustments mm-hmm. um you know the next car wasn't a, you know a fancy dancing car it was mm-hmm. you know just run of the mill but actually we quite enjoyed that it was like you know this is what we got is we used to call it the roller skate you know, yeah. you know <laughs> it was a great little golf um and um I was like, yeah, great. <laughs> Loved it. You know, it's it just, we just embraced it. We just embraced it. And and when uh, you say we, all I us, assume yeah. that means you and your wife and kids? Yep. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, so tell me about your wife. Like, was she supportive the whole way through? Was she, was she like, yeah, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, yeah. remarkable. And, um, you know, we couldn't have done it without her, quite frankly, if I'm, if I'm if I'm totally honest and um you know understanding and supportive and just f- full of belief I think mm. um, it's really it makes such a difference I think when you do have somebody in your life that's sort of cheering you on and telling you yeah you've got this because it is tough and and there are ups and downs and my poor husband yeah. you know he the the amount of times he's had to listen to me you know when <laughs> things aren't going how you'd like them to um, yeah. I think having having somebody, and it doesn't have to be a spouse, it can be a sibling or a best friend or a parent or whatever, but I think just having mm. at least one person in your life that's sort of cheerleading your your progress yeah. is quite important. And my kids, actually. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, they've, they've been really cool. You know, supportive. Uh, my son comes out with me. And we've got a drone now and he does all the like the drone footage and he helps oh, brilliant. build the hives and stuff. And so we sort of engage on that level, which is great. And my daughter, you know, I think she thinks it's cool, but like, <laughs> uh, she's, she, she's always a bit of a cheerleader. She's mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, Dad, that's ace. And then she obviously loves her honey, right? You know, yes. Stops her from having hay fever. So she's not so, so fond of occasionally getting stung. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know she's getting there. Part and parcel. <laughs> I'm afraid that is part and parcel. Yeah. Uh, I ask all my guests this: What does success mean to you now? So it's about being happy. You know that is ultimately it. Um, and you know, doing something lasting and meaningful in the world. And I think I'm doing that. And that. I'd go to bed at night going, today was a good day. Every day. Yeah. And I love that. Yes. That's that's a good feeling. Yes. You know, just coming back, I was at the at the at the wave yesterday and my son came and he did some drone stuff and it was just a run of a mill Monday, you know. But we came back and you know, we sort of made this these little kind of clips and edited them together and it was just like, Oh wow. Oh wow, look at that. How cool is that? um and the bees were doing great and yeah happy 
Do you miss anything about corporate life? No, not at all. Not at all. No. No, no regrets. No. No. I love what I do. I do love what I do. And I'm excited that you know, there's a phase two now, like I say, Night's Been Keeping 2.0, where we're doing these apiaries and stuff. That excites me greatly. That, that, that really does, because we are literally making a mark. And that that feels great. Oh, I'm great. so excited for you. And I'll be watching you on Instagram. Please do. And uh, hopefully I'll get to come and experience your... Yes, we'll get some suits on. Yes, well, I'd really love that. Honestly, I don't think it's something that I would have <laughs> like chosen to do. I love new experiences. I don't know where beekeeping would have been on my list, but having met you and having spoken to you and listening to you with, I mean, you're so excited and passionate about what mm. you do. It's impossible not to be infected by that passion, to be honest. So yeah. I, it's now, it's gone way up on my list of things that I'd like, love to try. So... No. Well, if you ever want to and you feel compelled to do it sooner rather than later, give me a call. I definitely will. Because we'll Thank get you down. We've got hundreds that you can look at. Yeah. Um, and I'd love it. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing more that I enjoy is 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 people like asking me questions and in amongst it. It's just, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I love it. I just, I genuinely love it. Oh, I wish you many, many, many more years of feeling so happy and joyous in your work. It's really inspiring. And I'm sure that people who are listening to this will take something away from it and hopefully implement it in, the, in their own lives and find something that they really just love getting out of bed for. Because there's far too many people who are uh, struggling to get up in the mornings yeah. and face the day ahead. So yeah. it's always lovely to share stories like yours thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it martin thank you it's been fun if you know someone who would enjoy this podcast do share it with them and subscribe now so you never miss an episode